From playing the Fool in King Lear, Butterball in Hellraiser, Onaka in Nightbreed, to playing Derek in The Book of Blood, welcome Simon Bamford. How are you? Oh, I'm very good, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, that's good. Uh, you've been keeping pretty busy with the conventions. I've uh, been following your post online. It looks like great fun. You went to uh, University of Cass, attended Motor City in... We went to Detroit, that's right, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that would be uh, beginning of May. Yeah, I think beginning of May. And okay. um, yeah, it was, a very, it was the first time we've done a show together um, in, uh, in Detroit. And it was very successful. Yeah, we were very, very busy there. Um, it's been it's been a very good couple of years for us actually because Clive started doing the convention circuit as well. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple more um, coming up this year. Um, we are going to New Jersey to uh, Days of the Dead in New Jersey in August and um, Connecticut Horror Fest in September. Nice. And I think there might be another one that Doug and um, Clive are doing. In Las Vegas, a new one. So, hmm. What was it like getting back with the, uh, the old crew, shall we say? It's good. It's good. We, we live a strange life. I mean, I've kept in contact with Clive over the years because we were friends before Hellraiser when, when he was a starving writer and I was a, an unemployed actor and just leaving drama school. So we've been friends for a long time. There we go. It's good to see him. But and when we meet up with the other ones, um, Doug and Barbie and Nick and I used to meet up at an airport and uh, and and fly over and, and do the conventions and and um, Barbie and uh, Doug and I have a convention that we always have dry martinis to start the convention. So nice. We do our James Bond bits, all wearing black, and uh, of course one martini leads to another and leads to another, and then oh, it's just oblivion. <laughs> Good fun. Yeah, unlike Nick, Nick uh, Chat Chatter is actually T Turtle, so he has Shirley Temples, but don't tell anybody because his street cred would be just ruined. <laughs> <laughs> so uh the dog company the dog company yeah all right uh can you tell us a little bit about that and how it came to be with you meeting clive barker in the first place yeah i was i was um at drama school and i was doing production of king lear and clive was an unemployed writer uh who lived nearby and had moved down from liverpool with um doug bradley mm-hmm and had started this company called The Dog Company with um, Oliver Parker as well, who played the removal men in uh, Hellraiser 1 and 2, and has gone on to have a great career actually directing films. Um, and Clive came to see me in this production and, and liked what I was doing and said, when you graduate, would you like to join the, the company? It was a fringe theatre company, so all the money that we made went back into doing other productions. Um, and that's what I did. And it was it was very interesting because Clive's writing was developing then. He he had been an actor up until that point. But when I joined, he stopped acting and just concentrated on writing and directing. But Oliver Parker, in one of the we did a thing called um, History of the Devil and Frankenstein in Love. I think it was Frankenstein in Love. We had we created a skinned man. So there are lots of the early themes from the Hellraiser films were kind of being experimented with within the dog company. So we had to build, build a, a complete bodysuit for Ollie Parker, um, which was obviously completely skin tight, but it looked like he'd had his skin ripped off him. It was really, uh, it was really clever, clever stuff that we were doing. Um, but because it was profit share and it was all Clive, a lot of the money that we made went back into the effects for the next productions. But we, we toured, we had a kind of base at the cockpit theatre in London we toured to the Netherlands, to um, uh, Germany, I think, and uh, up to the Edinburgh Festival. Nice. And that lasted for about two years I was with them. And then we all realised that if we wanted to be jobbing actors, we really needed to be doing something that was going to make make money. So the company was disbanded, and, uh, and that was the last I saw of anybody for a couple of years. Um, until I rang Clive out in the blue just to see what he was up to and how he was. And uh, it was just a very fortuitous phone call because he was just about to cast uh, Hellraiser. Oh, so wow. Okay. Perfect timing. He And we just had a chat and uh, he said, oh, do you want a part in my movie? Do you want to play a monster? And I said, yeah, that'd be cool. Not thinking anything of it, not thinking I'll be talking about it 33 years later. <laughs> yeah, so lucky, very, very lucky. Yeah, that's really awesome. 
Uh, I interviewed Nick a few months ago, and he credits you for getting him involved in working with Clive. Yes, uh, Nick and I were at drama school together, same drama school, yeah. and we were in the same year. And um, I think it was it was through my contact with Clive and, and getting to know him through the dog company, company that's, um, that Nick met Clive. And uh, he, Clive was also, Clive's a great artist now, but he was, again, he was just starting out and toying with um, art, uh, his art, so he was looking for models. So I think Nick did some modelling for him. Yeah, and yeah, that's what he said. The, he ended up one of the covers of the Books of Blood, mm -hmm. I think. And I, um, <laughs> I don't know, I, a story came to me, but I probably shouldn't tell it. Uh, what the hell? I made some um, special cookies because I was only like 24 then, 25. Okay. I made some special cookies one day for a party and Clive had just finished um, the first drafts of the first books of blood. The first book of the books of blood. But he didn't know what titles to give them. And he threw this party for all his friends and we all came over and and um, I took some of my special cookies and I said, he said, yeah. oh, he's got a very sweet tooth, Clive. He's got a very sweet tooth. Uh, I said, oh, I've got these lovely chocolate cookies. And he went, oh, well, lovely, innocently. Um, anyway, I went and got a drink and came back and uh, all the cookies are gone. I said, Clive, what, where, where are the cookies? He said, oh, they were delicious. And he <laughs> eaten all of them. And uh, he credits me with, um, he said, he went to bed that night. He had the most vivid dreams. And the next morning he woke up and he had all the names, all the titles for all the books of blood. So he credits me with the titles for the, the books, the, the, the story names of the books of blood one. But as I say, it was a different life. Yeah, that's an awesome story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's all right. I know brave or stupid. Right. One or the other. Well, you know. <laughs> so how was your experience in Hellraiser 1 and 2? And how did they differ from your point of view? Um, well, the main, I suppose the main difference was Hellraiser 1 was Clive, and it was also our first film. So for a lot of us, it was our first film. Um, image, image animation, the special effects, prosthetic effects crew were very young. I mean, we were all very young. We were all in a kind of late teens, early 20s. Um, the majority of people on it anyway. So, and for most of us, it was our first film. So it was kind of finding our feet. It was very exciting. It was also terrifying. Um, it, it was not what I expected. Um, on the first day when I went down and they, they actually, I had some test makeup shots done down at Pinewood. Um, but then when we actually got to start shooting it for real and I went and had the head put on properly, it wasn't till then that I realised I was going to be blind, deaf and dumb. <laughs> 14, 16 hours a day, and then and that's a very hard way of, uh, of, of acting. And then I realised on the on day one as well that also the, the makeup was so thick, it was about two inches of foam latex, that it didn't move at all. So there was no give. I could screw my face up as much as I wanted to, but the, make, the, the mask didn't move. It was just his face. Yeah. And that's it. His face was never going to move up from looking like that, which weirdly enough kind of worked because I, I was very again very lucky Clive realized very early on that the more the, um, tranquil we were the stiller we were the more powerful we were so he kept up he kept saying to Doug do less and, and Doug would say okay I'll, I'll do it and I said Doug, Doug do less do less do less until Doug said but I'm not I'm not doing anything and Clive said yes but the makeups are so extraordinary you don't need to do anything. And the less you do, the more powerful you do, powerful you are. And I think um, originally, I think, you know, we were going to be throwing the chains and we were going to be doing all the physical stuff. And again, the fact that we were just there, we were these presences that were there and the chains would just fly by themselves. It just, it, it just uh, empowered us. And, and he was absolutely right. And because of that, I got away with a mask which didn't move, being mm -hmm. blind, deaf and dumb having to kind of walk until I could feel something with my feet and turn to the right. So there wasn't a huge amount of acting for me or for Nick, really, to be honest. It was, uh, but, <laughs> so again, very lucky. Very, very lucky. But like I said to Nick, he brought up the same point, actually. Uh -huh. And, um, like, I would attribute, yeah, both of you guys for wearing that makeup. It was very restrictive. Yeah. But uh, he, he mentioned to me a couple of months ago when I was talking to him that initially his character 
was supposed to be more of like an animalistic, like jumping around. Yeah, that's right. And, he was supposed to be like the dog again with the dog company. Clive always goes back to the same themes and that. Yeah, dogs are one of them. Yeah, and then I I spoke to him and I was like, I I, I can't envision Chatterer or in your case Butterball being either off that type of character. I mean, it's the stillness and the more and the power of being quiet yeah. for the characters. Yeah, I did originally have dialogue um, uh, that got cut. Um, again, fairly early on, um, we got to the, my first scene where I had to speak the dialogue. And because I had all these dentures that were stuck on top of my own teeth, I couldn't get my mouth together. And when you can't get your mouth together, you can't say P's or B's because yeah. they're, they're plosives. Um, and all my lines were, perhaps we prefer you and impossible. There were things I just couldn't say. Mm -hmm. Because the budget at that point was very, very low. They, they weren't expecting to do ADR uh, to go in and dub stuff afterwards. So they all they could do was take all my lines away and give them to the female. So that was a, that was a bad day for me. So, yeah, Butterball did originally speak. Yeah. Um, there you go. That would have been that would have been interesting to see. I, I can't picture it. I yeah. I'm trying to picture what what the character would have been like with a speaking role. It would have been different. Very different. Very different. It yeah, I think, I think it would have been better, to be honest. I think it would have been better because you get a lot from the voice. You know, I, I, I had him as this kind of, kind of slathering, driveling, drooling pervert. Yeah. You know, a real, somebody really scary that you really wouldn't want to meet. No, that's right. Family, you know, <laughs> yeah. sweating, you know, just, just not nice character at all. Not a nice guy. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. You worked again with uh, Clive and Nick in Nightbreed. Uh, yeah. You played Onaka, and yeah. uh, that was shot at Pinewood Studios. How was yeah. that in comparison to uh, Hellraiser? It was like chalk and cheese. Um, Hellraiser 1 was done on such a tiny budget. It did increase when the studios saw the budget, saw the, the, st the skills. I'm just, um, just going to go and have a word with my dog. Give me two seconds. No problem. One second, folks. He'll be right back. Okay. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. So, um, Nightbreed uh, had a £40 million pound budget, which by these these standards today is nothing. But back then was huge. It was, uh, we had these huge sets at Pinewood Studios that were like kind of four stories high, um, that went on tunnels, that went round and through. The whole of the graveyard was there. The inside of Midian with the rope bridges. It was incredibly impressive. Um, for me, of course, suddenly from having all this makeup on, I had no makeup. Yeah. Um, I, I think it had more monsters than any other film, different monsters than any other film that's ever been made. I don't know if that still holds. Um, and the when Clive sent us the screenplay, well, we all read the book, which was a short story, and I, I was blown away by it. I thought, what an amazing book this is. And then he, then he sent us the screenplay, and the screenplay was just awesome it was so moving uh and it completely surprised you all the way through it yeah um and then we shot the film and halfway through filming it um the executive producer i think from morgan creek um was changed over and the first executive producer completely understood clive's vision that the the monsters were the goodies the story was about the monsters mm -hmm. and their persecution by the world around them um but the new guy who took over didn't quite get that he said no you're Clive Barker you make slasher films not that Hellraiser is a slasher film but um that's what we have to give our audience and so he he tried to mold that the he got rid of the Clive's editor who again was completely on board with Clive's vision and he tried to mold it into something which it never was and because of that the final theatrical release was a bit of a mess compared to what we were trying to achieve. Um, yeah. And uh, 25 years later, when they finally found all the footage, um, Clive got to, to uh, release a version of, which was much, much closer to what he was trying to achieve. Um, and so if anybody hasn't seen Nightbreed, watch the director's cut, which is available. Yeah. Now. Don't watch the theatrical release. No. But it was very exciting. It was very exciting to make. At the time, they um, they said it was going to be the new Star Wars for the horror genre or the fantasy genre. So there was a lot of buzz going on around it. Around it. Um, 
so it was kind of disappointing we didn't happen at the same time we were doing that batman was being made so we come out of our lot and on the on the back lot there was gotham city was being built it was huge it was amazing so we were like and also we um david cronenberg was just starting work on um the naked lunch um so we were trying to audition for him constantly persuaded we could play um cockroach typewriters and uh and stuff so yeah it was an exciting time it was very exciting until until we saw the final film and then it was really sad i've seen both but for anyone who hasn't seen the film in general watch the director's cut like simon said yeah and uh you're getting more of a uh clive barker vision for the film yeah it it, it spends more time to set up the characters uh, laurie and boone so you actually get to like them you get to know them um, and it kind of establishes a lot of us as well, the, the, the breed. Yeah. Interesting, there's been talk about the Sci-Fi Channel doing a, a TV version of it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't know if that'll happen, but it'll be exciting if it did happen. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who are some of your acting influences? James Mason was one, always one of my favourite actors. Okay. Um, uh, just because his voice was so good and he was so relaxed <laughs> kind of the opposite of what i am really i'm kind of i'm more of a, a robert england type fireball of energy <laughs> which is something i'm always trying to kind of calm down once i get it's quite interesting now um i'm doing a series at the moment called um dark ditties for uh, amazon prime and uh, i get to play six different characters in the six different episodes and it's really good for me because i can play energetic characters or well, on the last one i played this character who did very little indeed and just it was just very still and 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 it was quite it was i suddenly i realized how empowering it is to do nothing yeah um, but it's hard to do, do nothing you know it takes a lot of bravery and I, I i um on the last shoot some of the actors were saying the big thing um on film sets these days is to out nothing each other so two actors will be uh, uh, acting and, and one of them will try and be stiller than the other one you know, one of them will actually just really won't move a muscle and will just talk like this. Mm. And then the, <laughs> because that's the one on the screen that you look at for some strange reason. Isn't it weird? I don't get it. It's weird. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Clive Barker's Book of Blood. Yeah. Uh, that was with uh, Jonas Armstrong and Sophia yeah. Wood. Uh, yeah. I loved it. I own it. Uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about it, about the shoot and playing Derek. Uh, Sophie Ward is Simon Ward's son, uh, daughter. Lovely, lovely lady. And Jonas Armstrong played um, Robin Hood over here in the TV series. Um, it, interesting, um, when Clive wrote the original Books of Blood, obviously I knew him, he's an unemployed writer, going back to that. And the very first character in the first Book of Blood is a character called Simon McNeil. And that's what the books, the Book of Blood film is about it's a, it's that first story and Simon McNeil is a psychic who talks to the dead or pretends he can talk to the dead but the actual fact is he can't he's a he's a fraud and um I, I won't give too much away but that's kind of the basis of the story and Clive based not that he thinks I'm a fraud but he kind of based the whole characterize like characteristics of the character on me when he was writing it so when we went to the launch party of the Books of Blood, he, he signed my book to Simon, the McNeil boy par excellence. So when I found out that they were filming that film, um, I thought, well, he's got to give me a part in it because, you know, he wrote the whole film about the whole story about me. So I contacted the casting director and the director and I heard nothing about it whatsoever. And then, so the next day I, I sent an email to Clive and um, he said, oh, yeah, of course, we'll find something for you. I, obviously, I couldn't play the McNeil boy because I was too old by then. Um, so the following morning I woke up and the casting director and the director both emailed, oh yes, we've got something for you, it'll be lovely and everything else. So yeah, so uh, but I played a, a removal man. Another recurring theme you'll notice in Clive's films, yep. the removal man. So um, uh, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was interesting because it was all shot in Scotland, in Edinburgh, and uh, my character was initially Scottish. So all the dialogue was written, I can't remember the dialogue now, um, was written with kind of Scottish vernacular about it. Um, it was giving me the heebie-jeebies. It was all like this. And, so I, and, and 
Um, so I tried to kind of learn it in the Scottish accent. And the week before we went up to film it, I went on holiday with some Scottish friends and I kind of tried my accent on them and they just fell about laughing. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to be working with Scottish actors with a Scottish film crew in Scotland doing yeah. a Scottish accent, which the Scots think is ridiculous. I can't, I mean, my, 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 my uh, confidence levels just went through the floor. So um, I emailed the director and said, look, do you mind if I don't do the Scottish accent? And I was playing with a Scottish actor as well. And he went, no, 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 that's fine. So it just, when I listen to it back now, I think, oh, that's a bit odd that he's speaking with this kind of Scottish words, but it kind of worked. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was interesting. It was nice. It was that I'd, I'd had, after Nightbreed, I really only did theatre for about a decade. Um, so that was my introduction back to doing some film work. I love uh, it. Yeah, uh, I think all of those films, um, Matador pictures picked up and they were they were going to do all of the Books of Blood. And they did, oh, they did some beautiful ones. Uh, Midnight Meat Train with Vinnie yep. Jones and uh, Bradley Cooper. Oh, that, I think that film is magnificent. It is. The, it's gory as hell. But the beauty of the artwork on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the the New York subway is just beautifully filmed and and lovely, lovely film. Dread, they uh, they did that. I thought again, very exciting. The next one they were going to do after that was going to be Pig Blood Blues. So okay. <laughs> I remember, which was set in a like a, a, a youth detention center, where um, all the ch the kids, all the boys in this detention center, worshipped the pigs that they looked after. And it turns out that the, the pigs, actually, they were sacrificing, some of the boys were being sacrificed to the pigs. So I was trying to persuade Clive I could play, I could play a pig or something interesting in that. But it, sadly, then the recession happened and uh, that, was, that was the end, sadly, of, of that. Which was, which was a shame because there's so many, it's, Clive's got so many works that could be, could be made into films. Um, but it was kind of good for me because... Um, it made me think I would really like to learn more about the craft of um, film. And I didn't think I knew enough about it. So, um, in fact, I was talking to a friend earlier, and I, after that, I just said yes. I had a few years of saying yes to everything that was offered to me. So I did some student films and low-budget shorts and things, just to kind of try and hone, hone my craft. Um, and it worked. I kind of... Clive, Clive said to me, if you want to act... If you want to be an actor, if you said if you want to be a writer, then write. If you want to be an actor, then act. And yeah. I thought, no, no, he's right. If you want to be a film actor, then do film acting. You know, don't don't just. There's lots of excuses to to not do it. Um, and it's not always easy to do it. You have to go out of your comfort zone and take risks and things. But only by doing that can you improve. You can see your strengths and strengths and your weaknesses. And and that and, and it seems to have paid off. I hope it's paid off. Anyway. And there's um, a difference in. A few other uh, projects, um, Dead, Dead of the Night with um, uh, 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 Candyman. Um, Tony Todd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was fun to do. Um, and then this, um, uh, the Dark, Dark Ditty series, which, uh, which was interesting. The very first one, that was with Nick, Vince, and um, Barbie Wilde, female Cenobite from Hellraiser 2. Also, yeah. Ken Cranham, uh, who is in Hellraiser 2, and... Um, Oliver Smith, who plays the skin man in uh, Hellraiser 1 and 2. Yeah. yeah. So it was nice. We had a, a kind of reunion there. And, uh... Well, that's a good segue into actually my next point I was going to bring up. Good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to bring up the uh, the Tony Todd Dead of the Night. And uh -huh. I haven't seen it yet. Right. So no spoilers. But okay. can you give us just the, the ground lines on what the film is about? It's found footage. Um some a film crew that make an interesting love it's very connected to one of the film i've just done but anyway uh, um a film crew that are kind of psychic researchers so do one of um they go into haunted houses and they kind of film what happens in the haunted house okay. and the that they film and um it it starts when they're all discovered dead in this house that they've been filming in by tony todd yeah and, uh, and then it's about the police um, investigation and uh, obviously they find the footage that they were filming as they were shooting, as they were being killed. And so there's the research. And I play um, an IT, a police IT consultant. 
Um, okay, so it is a full length film. It's a full length, yes, yes. It's a full length film. It's, it's, I suppose, comedy character. It's, it has its faults in that it breaks some of the found footage rules, in my opinion, in that if you're, if you're doing found footage, you can't cut away to other shots because yeah. there is no other film crew there. It's just the found footage. And I think that's rule, that's quite a big rule to break, which is a shame. But uh, it's certainly worth trying. Yeah, it's, it's gonna. It is on my to watch list. I haven't watched okay. it yet, but, uh, but I will. Uh, and back in 2018, and actually the other thing segued right into this too. Talking about dark ditties. Yeah. Um, Finders keepers. You played Mr. Wainwright. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you want to tell the viewers a little bit about uh, about the uh, Finders keepers? Is, so all. The Dark Dishes are a very interesting series. It's it's a it's a cross between Black Mirror and American Horror Story. Each <laughs> of the stories is a standalone story, but as the series evolves, you realise that they're all interconnected. Um, and I, as I said, I play different characters in each one. Um, Wayne Wright was episode three, and I uh, I play a character who has stolen from uh, an organised crime gang. Um, okay. And the film starts just after I've thrown myself after a moving car when I realise I'm in it with my assassin. Mm. So I start it in a really bad way because I've thrown myself from a moving car onto a road. And uh, it would be safe to say it only gets worse for me <laughs> from then on. I've only got a fairly small part in that because I had such a huge part in episode two, which was Mrs. Wiltshire. Um, yes. And after that one, I said to the writers, "Look, on three, just I don't want I don't want a huge role because I've had so much. It was like a year's work, Mrs. Wiltshire. So that was a so that was a, a tough one. Um, episode four is just about to be. So episode Mrs. Wiltshire is. Uh, I'll, I'll go through them in order. Episode one is like um, Agatha Christie with chainsaws. Um, it's very it's tongue in cheek, dark. <laughs> black gory um episode two is like um it's been described as um alan bennett directed by john carpenter um so it, it's it's a ghost story but it is incredibly dark and very disturbing and most people when i tell them that it's very disturbing they go oh we love disturbing and then they'll come back the next at a convention say they'll come back the next day and they'll go okay that was really disturbing its yeah. subject matter is very very bleak <clears throat> just a warning number three again is back to comedy so that was the one with the organized crime gang and again that um that brings back kenneth cannon's character who was in episode one who i can't talk too much about there's lots of twists and turns throughout these episode four is about to be released um they're just doing the final, um, uh, adding the score. And uh, I think apart from that, I think it's pretty much done. Um, so that should be released in the next month or two. And that is called The Witching Hour. And that one is interesting because that's about uh, a film crew who go into haunted houses and film. So it's very similar, mm. to, except it's not found footage. Uh, and I play a character called, oh, who did I play? I can't remember. He's the, he's the groundsman. I can't remember his name. He's the groundsman of this big house that features also in episode one. And again, links into Kenneth Cranham's character from episode one. Um, but this has a more of a supernatural bent to it. And that's all I can really say about that one. And episode five, which they're sending the script for on Monday, which we're all very excited about, is called Dad. And that is set in the future. And a character in episode five, a supernatural character that in episode five, it's about after his zombie apocalypse has happened. And it's about these random people that are meeting up to survive a zombie ap apocalypse. Now, um, they asked me to put weight on for episode three, Mrs. Wiltshire, too, which I did dutifully. It's quite nice to be asked to put weight on, to be honest, <laughs> any excuse. Uh, but they've asked me after episode three to lose three stone which is 10, 20, 30, uh, 46 pounds. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> for because they want everybody thin for episode five. So um, I'm halfway there at the moment, um, which is interesting. Not as easy losing it as putting on. Not <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but so yeah. I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I, I play a character in that one who's lost his daughter, so it'd be quite an emotional one, I think. Um, and again, it ties up a lot of the loose ends. And then the series finale is episode six, which is called Band in the Run, and I assume we'll be filming that at the beginning of next year. And that that's series one of Dark This Is. At the moment, that's available. What episodes one to three are available on Amazon Prime in America and the UK. Okay. So we wouldn't be able to get that in Canada yet. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I'll change over my IP address or something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just disguise it or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've so, tried that, now, but it doesn't seem to work. Right. <laughs> oh my. Uh, I wasn't going to ask this. I had it as a side note. Okay. But I feel like I got to ask. Okay. As Simon Bamford, which of Clive's films that you were a part of is your favorite? Ooh, I would have to be Hellraiser. Um, because it was such an exciting time. I mean it wasn't it was it wasn't great fun for me to make, to be honest. But it was exciting to be a part of a film. It was exciting to go to Pinewood and work with a special effects company. I I grew up um, when all I, I grew up in a little village in England, and, and then the local news agents, all the other kids in the village, all the other boys, were trying to get the porno mags from the top shelf. <laughs> I was I was trying to get Fangoria from the top shelf because I was always fascinated by horror, fascinated by it. Um, so to make a horror film that has had this longevity without Hellraiser, I wouldn't be here. Hellraiser has given me a, a career. And it's 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 lovely, and it has uh, such uh, a warm following. And also, when when I look back on it, none of the other films have the, the careful craftsmanship in the storytelling. When you watch so so many projects these days, they have a storyline, they have an idea, and then a lot of it is just padding. They pad it out to fill a time schedule. Hellraiser is not like that. Every scene in Hellraiser is there for a purpose, and every scene. Links to, leads to the next scene and to the next idea and the next everything links and moves the story on. There's nothing extraneous in it at all, and that's so rare. Plus, of course, uh, it's 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 such a weird story, and it again, is. it works. And only Clive, I think, could make. You know, if you were to pitch that story, that you've got a woman who um, who's in an unhappy marriage um, with an unhappy um, stepdaughter. I mean, already people are going, oh, I'm not sure about this one. Everybody's unhappy to start with. Um, and she moves into a house and um, her dead lover starts to come to life through floorboards. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and she decides that she's going to um, go and find, pick up strange men and, and, and kill them and then feed the blood to her dead lover. And then I'm on top of that. Um, then you've got these four high priests from hell um, that are linked because the the reason he's been turned into this is because of this puzzle box. It's so there's so many levels to it. Um, you you could never nobody would ever nobody would ever touch it these days, which is brilliant. Which is, yeah. also it's also tragic because you need people to touch stories. You need people to take risks on stories like that to have more hellraisers, to have more unique cinema, to stop this constantly cranking out the same, same, same. It's and it, it's only the unusual. It's only the the new <coughs> voices coming through that we remember. Everything else is just repeats of the same old thing. It, that's such a shame. Uh, if I wish people would take more risks. Clive thinks outside the box. I've always said that. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and it, it's like you said now. Uh, in his way of a film, the way I put it is, he's very calculated in the way he he does his productions and whatnot. Yeah. It's it's marvelous. His brain is, even before, you know, when we were, he was an unemployed writer, he, I, I said to my parents, I've met this man and he is a genius. I said, he is completely unique. I've never met anybody with, a, with this kind of brain before. And he, it was like meeting Shakespeare, really. And I, I do, I don't say that lightly. You know, his writing oh. is so multi-layered and he's so underrated. It's such a, it's such a shame. Um, I, I fear that you know his 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 heyday will be after he's gone, which is terrible. Yeah, he deserves better than that. Yeah, um, Nick 
what was it Nick said when I was talking to him? There was a little story that he was saying there anyway. And it was a little, a little running joke, I guess, between the actors. Uh, Clive is a sick puppy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Uh, something to that effect. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, like, I, I'd like to spend five minutes inside of his head just to see where the whole concept of Hellraiser came from. <laughs> Clive always said if he hadn't become a writer, he would have been a serial killer. He said, <laughs> he, said he has so many ideas constantly coming into his brain that, he, you know, if he hadn't been able to get them out onto paper or into, into art or in some way yeah. getting them out, it would have driven him and created the same, you know, so... <laughs> The beautiful mind of Clive Barker. Yeah, yeah, oh, it really is. It really is. It still is, you know. He's, 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 a, he's a wonderful. And oh, on top of that, he's a, just a lovely, lovely human being. Incredibly generous, incredibly giving, uh, encouraging, sharing, um, and gives credit where it's due. He's, he's a, he's a true hero. I, I have yet to meet the man, but it has to be done. It has to be done. <laughs> As somebody who uh, is an actor and director, designer, producer, like yourself, uh, can we expect any upcoming projects later this year or early 2020 other than what we spoke about earlier being the Dark Diddies? Dark Diddies, I did a film um, last year uh, called um, Sunshine, which was a love story, which is uh, unusual for me. Um, and then um, that um, hopefully will be uh, that was filmed over two years, so we finished filming earlier this year. So hopefully end of this year that should be coming out. Um, and also I did a film called Starfish last year with Joe Froggart, who's a Golden Globe winner. Um, she was in Downton Abbey, and the guy who played um, uh, the lead in Da Vinci's Demons. Okay. I'm going to get his name. Uh, that's about <laughs> that's a true story about a guy who got sepsis. Um, really, really wonderful film. It's been out in the UK for a while now, but hopefully it will it will cross over to there. But I highly recommend Starfish. It's uh, it's very moving. That's all I'll say. It's very moving. It's about what happens when a family that seem to have everything are torn apart overnight. Um, and it's it's a beautiful film with just some amazing performances in it. Um, I'm also just been asked to produce a film. Um, <sighs> Uh, I've got my first meeting about it next week. I think it's called The Invisible Principle, just okay. a short film, um, with Ian Gelder from Game of Thrones and Mark Wingett from um, a series over here called The Bill. Um, and I think, I think he did. Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember. So yeah, so uh, that's what's coming next for me. And I'm really looking forward to getting the, the scripts for Doctor Who. It's so exciting. So I can't wait to get the next one and. I get my teeth into it and see what kind of character they've got. I'm going to wait for them all to come out and binge watch right on through. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but watch them in order. You have to watch yeah. them in order. Yeah. So you're saying it's like an anthology, separate stories that tie together. Yeah. When you see, and they're all completely different, even the feeling of them is different. And by the time you've watched the second one, you'll think, well, these, these could never tie together. They're completely different. But they do. They do. They're really clever. And there's lots of little Easter eggs peppered through that there's lots of little nice. hell race boxes and things everywhere and uh um there's there's incredible twists and turns and links to other episodes uh it's 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 really fun to work on them and they're That's a lovely lovely company I, I really and they always get great actors who are just easy to work with so there's a great atmosphere on set makes life a lot easier that way too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. definitely <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring actors, actresses, or really just anyone in general that has an interest in getting into the industry in some way? My mind would be the same advice that Clive gave me, really. If you want to do it, do it. Now, that seems flippant. Um, and, you know, that's easy for you to say. But it wasn't when, you know, and it isn't. So find somebody who's doing some short films. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, doesn't matter. They might not be good. But they give you excuse, an excuse and experience of being in front of a camera. And when they're finished, hopefully, you'll get a chance to look back and analyse your performance. It's the worst thing in the world. You know, everybody knows what it's like to, to hear their own voice. It's the worst thing in the world to see yourself performing. It's because all you see is faults. But nobody yep. else sees those. Um, so don't worry about that so much. Just 
but just get out there and do it. Find somebody who's doing short films and and do as many as you can. And that will lead to other things because by then you'll end up with a, a showreel and it might not happen. There's an incredible amount of luck involved. Um, uh, I know people who are wonderful at networking. Frankly, I've always been appalling at it. Um, you know, I go to parties and I see these people and they're talking to you. They're talking to you, but they're not really looking at you because they're constantly scanning the room to see if there's somebody more influential that they really should be talking to. Oh, well, I do that. And if I see somebody more influential that I should be talking to, um, I avoid them like the plague because I, I clam up. Like, I, you know, I, I don't know what to say to somebody who might be good for my career. And actually, I said to Clive, you know, we were good friends. And when um, uh, Hellraiser kind of <laughs> took him up to the Giddy Heights, suddenly he was surrounded by groups of his people, as, as the uh, Los Angeles people say. I mean, and he was very difficult to get hold of. And I said, Clive, it's very difficult for me to talk to you on the same level now, because he said, yeah, but we're, just, we're still just friends. I said, yeah, we are. But now you're a friend who could completely change my whole career. You know, and that's, you've got this incredible power. And, and that's... It's difficult to relate to you in the same way. And uh, everybody else can understand that, but he couldn't. And, and I, mean, I understand why he couldn't, because as far as he's concerned, not much should change. But of course, it has changed. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of luck. But just get out there, do it, and enjoy it as well. Um, if you're you're not relentless. Joking, yeah, there's no fun. Breathe. Uh, breathe. Um, watch your diction. Um, you'll see also <laughs> episode one of... Um, Episode one of uh, Dark Ditties, I, I did this awful, why nobody said to me, uh, my character, it's, uh, I, I did lots of, well, uh, uh, my character's constantly got his mouth open, and I watched it back, <laughs> and I thought, why did nobody tell me I look like a goldfish all the way through it, uh, 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 like this, so now I say to the criminal I work with them, tell me if I've got my mouth open, and oh, no, I thought she's like this, <laughs> so, you, you know, you're constantly changed, but it's fun. There we go. Fun. And also, uh, uh, personally, I like to have a little gimmick. Like the last last character I played in the, I had a, just one contact lens, like he got a cataract in one eye. L tiny, tiny little things like that can make quite a difference because they draw you in. It doesn't need to be big, but something tiny can make a, just make your character stand out a little bit more. The subtle things. Yeah. 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 I got a couple of viewer questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Yep. Bradley Lynch from Rant and Raven Reviews writes in, what was the makeup process like back in the Hellraiser days and how long did it take to do your character? Mine was pretty quick. Um, the Masters One piece, um, it was about two inches thick and the inside of it was molded to completely match my face. Okay. Um, it took three people to pull it down. So I go in the morning and we were picked up at some awful time, like 3 a.m., in the makeup chair for 5 a.m. They put a skull cap on me, kind of glue that down so that it didn't rip my hair out. Uh, then they cover my eye, any uh, hair with uh, Vaseline. They made up my mouth black so that you couldn't see me through his mouth. That became a running joke with the spe special effects crew, which I didn't know until like 10 years ago when they okay. admitted it to me. So by Hellraiser 2, this little bit of black makeup around here was like, they went, they went to see how much of my face they could make. So half my face was black like this, which they thought was hilarious and I didn't know anything about. Cause, um, but anyway, so uh, but when they, it took three of them to pull it down. Um, over and that, Because it was skin tight, it got to a point where my nose was completely sealed up inside of it. Wow. And I thought, if this gets sticks here and they, don't, and they can't get it down, I will suffocate because I can't breathe now at this point because it was covering my mouth and my nose. Um, so they were like, they struggled to get it on, and then finally it would like plop into place. And then they kind of glue all the edges down with the surgical super glue they use in the day. So these days they use prostate and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then the body, because I was quite skinny in those days, they wanted a skinny actor to play a big guy because he had that big wound in his stomach. And it was like a fiberglass yoke that went over my shoulders. And the wound was quite deep, so I could get my whole hand into my stomach. Um, and then the costume, the leather costume kind of strapped around that and uh, onto my hands and everything else. Um, and that was that was kind of it. And then they kind of did some kind of fine tune, as I think, you know, by which point I couldn't see anything because there were no eye holes in it. There were no ear holes in it because he cut his ears off. 
So I really was blind, deaf. Um, there was no nose hole in it because he had no nose. So we could, there was Nick and I sitting in the corner of the makeup room for the rest of the day with the dentures in. And because of the dentures, we couldn't close our mouths. So when you can't close your mouth, your mouth fills up with saliva all the time. Yep. Um, so to stop, and it's the only way we could breathe. So to stop suffocating, you, we were just the two of us sitting in the corner going, Shh. that was the sound of Hellraiser for us. Shh. <laughs> 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 But it was it was normally on a film crew, especially back then, where where it wasn't done in post production. You know, every every shot had to be moved around and had to be relit, relit. Everything took hours to do. You would sit, and you knew it would take hours. But you'd sit and you'd chat with the other actors. You'd read a newspaper, you'd read a book, or you'd you'd do something. But of course, when you can't see and you can't talk, and you can't really hear. All you can do is sit in this black world with your own thoughts. And, and so it was quite, very, it was very, very, very claustrophobic. And there were, there were quite a few moments. I'd, you know, I get to about hour five of this thinking, I can't bear this. I can't, I can't bear this. And I, and I, I just had to, it's like going to the dentist. I, I give myself a little talk. Look, if you panic now, they'll only get somebody else in and that'll be it. Or if you panic now, they'll rip it all off and then you'll only have to put it back on again. So just calm down, breathe deal with it it will all be over soon right <laughs> and and each day was like that and each day more and more i would dread coming into work <laughs> yeah sorry i wish i could say it was great fun but it, it really wasn't <laughs> but i bet in a way you wouldn't change it i wouldn't change it no i wouldn't change it <laughs> all right kate uh, ledrew writes in uh, if you could have dinner and a conversation with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? What would the conversation and meal be? Okay, um, I had the great <clears throat> of playing Roddy McDowell in the Fright Night documentary, um, Your Soul Cool Brewster, um, a few mm. years ago. And because of, uh, I kind of grew up watching Roddy McDowell films, you know, the, the, uh, and because of that, because I was going to be playing him, I got to study his character and I was fascinated by him. So I'd love to meet Roddy McDowell and just talk to him about, he, he, he moved from Wales to America um, when he was uh, about 13, I think, 12, okay. 13, within, to New York. Within a few months, he got this part, this lead in this film and was working in um, Los Angeles, which the film was a huge success. And then he was taken into the old Hollywood star system as it was in those days and back in those days they would they would take an actor and they would teach them everything they knew about film technique about diction about how to be a star you know everything about it, about style and I, I think i think that would be really interesting because we that doesn't happen these days you know it's uh it'd be interesting to learn just what that was like and and the research i i found about him there wasn't a single person had a bad word to say about him. Everybody <laughs> had praise for him. He was so universally liked and admired. So uh, it was, uh, he would be the one, I think, an unusual choice, but um, just having studied him so much, it would be, it would be great to chat with him. Here you go. Now I got to actually go here now and look up the other two. Should just take a second. Lance Wagner. Mm -hmm. He says, gotta ask about working with horror royalty. Clive freaking Barker is the way. <laughs> <laughs> Hellraiser and Nightbreed. I also saw he's in a uh, in production on a movie called The Fourth Reich with horror royalty Tom Savini and Doug Bradley co-starring with them. Yes. So would you happen to know anything about uh, about that for us? The Fourth Reich has been in pre-production for a long time now, uh, probably five, six years. Um, uh, something snow. There was, it, w when it was first um, sold to a pitch to us, it was completely unique. Basically, it was a zombie um, Second World War film. Um, and the Fourth Reich um, were discovering... Uh, the, the, I know that's right. The the, uh, the Allied forces discovered that the Germans had been experimenting 
and had created this Fourth Reich, which were basically zombies. Oh. Um, so it was it was a really interesting and unique story and clever, and they were very keen to have the authenticity absolutely correct. They were going into huge detail on on the detail on the on the details. Um, and then something snow, I can't remember the name of the film, came out about the same time, which was very similar themes. And sadly, it's never moved on from that. It's still on IMDb, so it still might happen. And it would be nice, if, it would be good if it did happen, but it's, mm -hmm. it has been in pre-production for a long, long time now. So I'm not sure if it, it'll ever get made, which is a shame, because it's an interesting premise. It is, it is. Um, I think I know that film you're talking about too. Was it called Dead Snow? Dead Snow, that's the one. Yeah. Dead that's Snow, yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it. But it I, is a similar theme, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have that here on Blu-ray or DVD somewhere. Uh-huh. All right. It would be interesting to see it uh, come to production, though. So talking about Clive royalty, uh, I'll, I'll admit something which I probably shouldn't. There was... Uh, have you seen Penny Dreadful? Yes, yes. The Dreadful. And the way that that takes... Um, it's the world... Different worlds from different stories and puts them into one story. Yep. So it's taking lots and lots of different stories and melding them into one. There was um, a project pitched to Nick and to Ashley Lawrence and Doug, I think, and myself called The Harrowers. And okay. basically, I probably shouldn't say this, but what the hell? This is a few years ago as well now. This was the same idea that Penny Dreadful do, but with Clyde stories. Oh, so, wow. So you were taking characters from the, 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 it was, they were pitching it to MGM TV and there were characters from Hellraiser. There were characters from Nightbreed. Um, there was a carpet. So there was Ashley's char character from, uh, from Hellraiser. She was in this big house. There was this big carpet, which okay. is from, is it the Great and Secret show or Weed World? Weed World. Weed World. Um, so there are all these different Clive Barker stories and different Clive Barker characters all coming together into this one multiverse story. It was so sodding exciting. And oh, 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 it never got made, which is so, so frustrating because it would have been brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. And uh, they kind of pitched it to us. And I got this, uh, they were asking for our ideas as well. I, I had the idea that Onaka because obviously in, Her in Nightbreed he explodes with the sun, and that um, he, he, he explodes, but his atoms are still out there, so he can then reform and shapeshift into any character he wants. So I had this idea that for series one, there were these odd characters around in the episodes just kind of watching. And basically, and it wasn't until series two that you realised that actually this is Onaka shapeshifting, and that he's watching and he's helping the breed and helping the, the people. Um, yeah. But I said, and that would be great if I could play all these different characters. So one, but with, not with CGI, but with prosthetics mm -hmm. and acting. Um, so, you know, one day, I, one day I'd be a biker, the next I'd be a kind of truck, huge trucker, the next I'd be a, a prostitute, you know. It would just be really interesting to... And, and that's kind of, it, weirdly, what's happened with, um, with Dark Ditties is I get to play all these amazing characters but it would have been so cool that would have been awesome yeah so yeah. hopefully that might i probably shouldn't have revealed it but there you go i have <laughs> <laughs> so we got an that's exclusive a, that's an exclusive yeah here first folks thank you <laughs> you're welcome all right so les and connie rose now i'm going to try to keep my personal opinion to a minimal on this uh, Les and Connie write in, they say, I've just seen something saying a, about a Hellraiser revamp with a female version of Pinhead. Uh -huh. Is it true? If so, what are your thoughts? Personally, I think it might be somewhat appealing in a sense, but I don't like the ideas of remakes in general, especially when it's not true to the story and characters. Well, that's interesting because the original story, um, the lead in the bike was actually the female in the uh, the Hellbound Heart. So, yeah. in some ways, that's actually more true to the. In the in a way, it story. is. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. There've been stories of revamps. Um, I know Clive 
Um, he, one of the times I was around there, he ran part. He ran um, some ideas past me that he was putting into um, a reboot, whatever mm-hmm. that is, um, uh, which were. He wanted to know if he was going too far. <laughs> if they were too too shocking, obviously I can't tell you what they are. But they uh, no. I said no. You're Clive. You know I don't think you can be too shocking because it's very interesting with horror or any of life generally. You constant the boundaries constantly have to be moved. So what was taboo twenty years ago, you has to be. It's and then you say, well, what's where 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 does that end? You know, where, where, where do these taboos, if you're constantly going to break taboos and constantly push those boundaries, is that a good thing? Mm. I don't know. I know there were things, uh, I, don't know, I have to be a bit elusive. There were things Clive 40 years ago said he would never do. They were, they were his boundaries that he would never work, he would never cross because he thought they were wrong. And um, now with the, the stuff that he was writing, um, he, had, he had crossed them. I think that's why he wanted to see if they were, if I thought they were too much. He was using me as a, as a kind of a sounding board. Um, there have been lots of talks. There's been something recently about uh, um, a quite famous, I can't remember who's, who is, a famous uh, established director doing a, a kind of reboot, remake, rethink. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure they'll ever do it because I don't think a load of, 70s teenagers in a house um, that fall asleep and have bad dreams and, and, and dream of this man that comes alive and kills people dated because it was 70s teenagers in a house having pool parties. The only thing that really ages Hellraiser these days is, is big hair, 80s hair and shoulder pads. Everything else is so kind of stylish and kind of film noir um, that it, it kind of still holds up. And, and I know kids, I mean, one of the big studio things from doing remakes is because they say the younger generation don't like to watch old movies. Yeah. And I understand yeah. that. Um, I, I went back to watch The Exorcist uh, with my nephew a few years ago, and I was really surprised how slow it was. And it wasn't, yeah. but it was because we've become so used to having in, it's just information fired at us because of this. Yep. All the time. We're processing information all the time. And that's what we now expect. <clears throat> Exorcist was so <laughs> slow, establishing things, explaining things. But how is it doesn't really do that? Like I said earlier, the, the, everything moves Everything moves on. Everything's well designed. So, I mean, and then the kids I've seen, I know who've seen it recently, have enjoyed it as much as their parents have. So whether it's necessary, I don't know. Whether it will happen, probably one day. I, I don't know. I don't well, know. After. There may well be rights issues as well, of course, because of the whole um, uh, Weinstein thing, because it was the, the other Weinstein brother who earned the rights. I don't quite know who, if they've been relinquished now. Um, Hellraiser 3 onwards was a different production company on the rights, but the original 1 and 2 were the Weinsteins and them. Yeah. Um, I asked Nick if... Uh... Because, I mean, for those who don't know, the Hellraiser franchise continued on for several films with uh, with Clive stepping back yes. from, from it as much as he did. Yeah. Um, and I asked Nick if he would do a... a I, I said reboot. I don't really call it a reboot, but uh, would he come back for another Hellraiser? Uh-huh. And, and he said, not unless it had Clive. He said, if it had Clive, he was there in a heartbeat. So... What if Clive Barker called you tonight and said, I'm doing another Hellraiser. Would you be on board? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. But uh, there would be uh, would be requests. There wouldn't be demands because you can't really do that. But there would be requests that my character could speak, could yeah. see, <laughs> could actually yeah. act. And, you know, you, you utilize my, uh, my abilities a little bit more. Yeah, it'd be um, nice but... to see the original cast uh, do one more. We, we, we always said if there were going to, was going to be a remake, um, we assumed that they wouldn't use us as the Cenobites because they always tend to, to move on. But um, I don't know if you remember, there was a dinner party scene early on in Hellraiser. Yep. Uh, all the friends of um, um, Claire and, and Ken, uh, not Ken, uh, Andrew. Um, and we thought it would be quite fun if actually the, the guests at the dinner party scene were the original Cenobites. 
See, it's something like that would be awesome. I think the fans would love that. We'd love that. Yep. Because it would just be just a nod, you know, to yep. us and the work we've done. And uh, I, I think that would be fun. I think that would be enough. It would be a nice homage. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. You also got me thinking there, too, about the original concept of uh, the hell priest, I guess, or it would have been a priestess. Uh-huh. Right? So, technically speaking, if Clive stuck with that concept for Hellraiser 1, Grace would have been the lead. Yes, she would. Or yes, she Barbie would. in part two. You know, And, and it's interesting, again, uh, again, going back to the Clive's recurring themes, he always writes strong women characters. If you think oh, Laurie... Laurie was really the uh, the hero in, um, well, it was a very strong character in Nightbreed. I mean, if you think of Kirsty, you know, mm -hmm. Kirsty is far, far stronger than her boyfriend. Her boyfriend yeah. is useless, to be honest. Um, and um, um, Claire Higgins' character, obviously, is is incredibly strong character. Um, and if the female Cenobites had also, then it would have been this triptych of strong women way yep. way decades before that had ever really been done before you know and, and if you think or again if you think of andrew we, uh, andrew was at the convention recently and he's such fun to do a show with hearing him talk but he, he said he said my character in her is such a wimp you know he's, <laughs> he's this pathetic downtrodden nice guy that really has got nothing about him and he said and then the joy of him i mean not many actors could play that and make it work but because he's such a good actor, he could play that with, you know, there's very little to work with there, still make it interesting. But he said, oh, my God, he said, when I got to play Frank, you know, with uh, Andrew's skin on, yep. oh, my God, he said, then it was everything to play for. He said it was fantastic to go, you know, Jesus wept and all of that. It's uh, great. He won, that, won that was life. awesome. That whole scene was fabulous. Clive, I mean, Clive also says, he also says the the reason Hellraiser was such a success, A, down to Andrew, um, may, an awful, he, he gives an awful lot of credit to Claire because it's her character that the audience have to follow on this Alice in Wonderland storyline. And if they don't believe her, then it's lost. And she does it, she just does it in this film noir vamp way. She, her pitch is perfect on it. And also to um, Christopher, uh, the, the score. Oh, I can't remember Christopher. Oh, this is terrible. I can't remember his name. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But the score of Hellraiser is just, it's, oh, I can't remember his name. It's just amazing. And it's a waltz. It's a love story, which is uh, interesting. It's, it's all, um, da, 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 da. it's yep. all one, two, three. It's a dance. And it's it's a beauty, you know. Who else would put a waltz to a horror film? Right. And it, works, and it works beautifully. It does. And he said he said there was this wonderful moment when him and Chris Fig, uh, Fig the producer, and uh, were sitting with the film for the first time. They saw it with a score, and they they said they all got goosebumps because they knew they had a hit. Once the score was added to it, they knew it was going to work. And it's going to work really well, and uh, so yeah, those those are the people that the the real um, linchpins in in the success of the film. Far more than I was. There we go. <laughs> all right. Well, that's uh, that's about all I have. So, uh, so if the folks want to follow Simon on Twitter, Facebook, and on your website, what would be uh, your social media where they can find you? Okay, so I'm a um, very good question. <laughs> uh, just kind of look out for me on, uh, I think uh, it's Simon Bamford on um, Facebook. I think it's Simon.Bamford1 on Twitter. But you'll see, actually, I must do something better. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see my pictures. You'll find me. Yeah. And also, I've just gone on Instagram. Um, I've only got like 400 followers on Instagram because I, I don't really don't understand it at all. But um, yes, I am on Instagram as well. I should know all this information, shouldn't I? But, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah, please do go ahead, follow me. Um, I haven't got a clue how you find me, but you'll find me. I look I'll share some links. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Here we cool. go. I'll share some links for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Simon, for doing the show. It was an honor to have you. Cheers. And uh, don't I'll forget. 
Uh, yes, yes. I'm on to I'm on to Barbie we all next. Uh, she was female Cenobite uh, in part two, folks. Uh, she took over uh, Grace's character from part one. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know. And yeah, so that'll be Nick, yourself, and Barbie. And uh, that leads me with one left. <laughs> and then I got to try to track down Clive. Yes, okay. Good I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping on that. All right. Don't, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching, guys. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.